Hi everyone, welcome back and good morning. Today we're joined by Dr. Brandon Webb to discuss herd immunity. We've heard this term a lot when it comes to COVID-19 and other viruses, and Dr. Webb is going to break that down for us. He is a infectious disease physician here at Intermountain Healthcare. Brandon, it's nice to see you again. Welcome back. Thanks, Amanda. So let's just start simply with what is herd immunity? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like you said, super important topic and very rele relevant to um, our discussion about COVID. So simply put, herd immunity is also known as population immunity. And what it means is it's this biological concept of how much immunity you need to develop within a group or a population or herd, if you will, in order to control an infectious disease without having ongoing outbreaks. And what determines whether herd immunity is actually possible for any sort of given disease? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, it's actually not possible for a lot of infectious diseases. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's important to understand what factors do contribute to whether herd immunity is possible for a given infectious disease. And really it boils down to two main factors. The first is what percentage of the population of individuals need to be able to develop immunity. And the second big factor is how long does that immunity last? And those two factors really decide whether it's possible to generate herd immunity or not. And when you're thinking about this um, from an infectious disease standpoint, what proportion of the population has to become immune in order to even develop an effective herd immunity? Great question. Um, to answer that, why don't we take a couple of very common viruses as examples. So measles is one of the most contagious viruses on earth. And norovirus <clears throat> is right behind it in terms of contagiousness. Now, norovirus um, is the common stomach bug that I think people are unfortunately very familiar with. It can run through a household. And um, measles and norovirus uh, both have fairly similar contagiousness. Contagiousness, or, or how easily something's transmitted, is measured by a term called the transmission rate. And the transmission rate simply means that for every individual who gets sick, how many additional cases do we expect? Measles in, and norovirus are very, very contagious. For every case of infection, we expect between 14 and 18 additional cases for measles. And for norovirus, like I said, it's not far behind. It's for every case of infection, we expect 10 to 12 more very, very infectious. Now, by comparison, influenza, for example, has a reproduction number, a transmission number of two. So for every influenza case, we expect two more. So clearly measles and, and uh, norovirus are much more contagious. And in order for a population to have enough immunity to control a very contagious disease like measles, it would require 95% of the individuals in the population to have immunity. Same thing for norovirus. So for the example of flu that you just brought up, do we have herd immunity to influenza? And if so, what is that percentage? Yeah, great question. Um, influenza, like I said, has a, a lower transmission rate and it would require about 70% of the population to have immunity to influenza to have herd immunity. But influenza is tricky because genetically it shifts its genetic code every year. And so we don't have time to generate 70% of the population with immunity to influenza before it shifts. And we have to start all over again every single year. That makes sense. That explains why we also get a vaccine every single year and how it changes from year to year. And I, I wanna talk a little bit about the durability of immunity. How does that play into all of this concept of herd immunity? Perfect. So we talked about the two factors that determine whether herd immunity is possible. The first is how, what percentage of the population need to be immune. And the second is how long does that immunity last? So let's go back to measles and norovirus for just a minute. Uh, the immunity to measles lasts decades to up to a, up to a lifetime. So you can quickly um, can quickly see that 
over the course of a lifetime of individuals in a population, you could get up to 95% or above immunity in a population because you have plenty of time to accumulate immune, individual, immune individuals. Think about norovirus though. The immunity to norovirus only lasts about six months, which is why every Thanksgiving that tends to run through households and kind of ruin everybody's holiday because every year, if you've had it before, your immunity's worn off the next time you're exposed to it. And that, that is the big difference because for measles, herd immunity is possible, but for norovirus, it's not. And, and the driving factor is how long lasting the immunity is. And what other types of viruses are not controlled by herd immunity? You mentioned the neurovirus. What other viruses have people heard of that this does not correlate to? So for most of the respiratory viruses, so these are viruses that cause uh, the cold and the flu, so influenza, RSV, the four other coronaviruses that have been around in our, in our population, in our herd for hundreds of years, all of those respiratory viruses generate very short lasting immunity, nine months at the most. And that's why they're called seasonal viruses because by the time the next cold and flu season comes around, our immunity has waned and we're susceptible to them again. So in general, those types of viruses um, cannot be controlled by herd immunity. It's just not possible because the immunity just doesn't last long enough. So walk us through how this applies to COVID-19. You mentioned other coronaviruses. Walk us through why and how, or why this topic is so relevant um, for COVID-19. So the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 is a member of the coronavirus family. And, and in the last 10 months, we've learned a tremendous amount about the SARS-CoV-2 virus and some very well done research by renowned uh, virologists now suggests fairly accurately that the duration of immunity to SARS-CoV-2 is on average about six months with a range of between three and nine months. And we're actually starting to see that already. Um, we're seeing people in our, in our community who have had documented COVID-19 three months ago, six months ago, and now they're back in with the same symptoms and a new positive test and they've got it again. So it's, it's bearing out what we understood all along of, of the other coronaviruses, which is that the immunity just doesn't last a long time. The other thing that we now understand is, is how contagious uh, this is. So the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, has a transmission rate that really depends on how well we're, we're uh, behaving in the community. Uh, the, the transmission rate for the SARS-CoV-2 virus is about two uh, if we're not doing a good job controlling it. So it's similar to influenza. And what that means is in order to achieve herd immunity, we would need 70% of the population to have immunity. And we'd need that 70% to all be infected in a nine month period of time. So you mentioned that it's been about nine months and we are kind of starting to see that it's this nine month range. Do we have any information about how much of a percentage of our population is actually immune, immune to COVID-19 now, especially given that like range you specifically talked about and people retesting again? Is there any sort of evidence that we're getting to that 70%? Yeah, there's evidence that we're not anywhere close to that 70%. Um, it's hard to tell uh, because our antibody tests are simply not accurate because they only, they're not accurate enough, I should say. Uh, they're able to detect antibodies, but antibodies only tell one part of the immune story. To really tell whether someone's truly immune, you have to do um, an extensive amount of testing that just isn't done routinely. But when it has been done in populations around the country and around the world, the answer has been fairly consistent that somewhere around four to 10% of the population have been exposed to or have had COVID-19 in the last nine months. So we're, we're not anywhere near 70%. Yeah, that number is a lot lower than I was expecting. Um, and a lot of people have just proposed that we get rid of restrictions completely and kind of just let COVID-19 run its course to quickly achieve that 70%. What would this kind of strategy look like and what would the impact be? So first of all, 
um, let's go back to COVID-19. Like the other coronaviruses and like influenza, it's simply not possible, it's not practical uh, to achieve herd immunity for reasons that we just talked about because the immunity is short lived and in a nine month period, it's nearly impossible to have 70% of the population uh, be infected. But just hypothetically, let's talk about what that would look like if we were to take a, an, an approach or a strategy of just taking all of the breaks off, uh, removing all restrictions and just letting the, the disease run its course through the population. To get 70% of the US population, we're talking about 230 million people would need to be infected in a nine month period. So that would be, that would be 850,000 new cases every single day. That sounds uh, astoundingly high, but it's actually, if you think about it, not that much higher than, than where we are right now. We're at 100,000 cases a day, and that's too many. <clears throat> but if we were to try to take the brakes off altogether and get up to 800,000 cases a day, the effects would be devastating. Let me, let me describe what I mean by that. So for example, with that number of cases per day, we'd be talking about more, we'd be talking about five times more people would be sick during that nine month period than in any flu season. And we've got really good economic data from how flu impacts the workplace. We know that if five times more people were infected with the coronavirus than get the flu every year, we would have more than a billion work days lost. So the absenteeism in the workplace would be it'd be tremendous. Um, from the flu data, that would equate to about $109 billion in lost wages, lost revenue for workers, if we just took the brakes off and let it run its course. But from a public health standpoint, there's, there's even more grave uh, um, implications. So if 800,000 or more cases a day were accruing in the population, we would expect to see about 42,000 admissions to the hospital every single day. And in that nine month period, we would accumulate over 9 million patients hospitalized in the US. That, that is a number that would very easily overwhelm the American healthcare system. And with that many, that many patients with severe COVID, we would expect even with relatively low mortality rates that 2.3 million Americans would die if we just took all the breaks off and let it run its course. 2.3 million in a nine month period is more than cancer, heart disease, stroke, accidents and car accidents combined. That's a lot wow. of unnecessary lives lost. Yeah, it, it's very crazy to hear it put into those terms I mean, when you're comparing it to other sorts of diseases or uh, accidents that happens because a lot of a lot of people have actually said there's a lot more car accidents than people dying of COVID or cancer or stuff like that. So it's interesting to see that if we were just to get rid of everything, um, we would end up exceeding those deaths. And, and I want to ask you a quick question. Someone just mentioned um, on the Facebook Live we're not going to get herd immunity if we have to stay away from everything. This concept of you picking up germs and everything like that. Do you have any thoughts around that person's comments? Yeah, they're actually right. So the, the more we do to control the virus, um, the lower the transmission rate is. And remember the percent of the population that's, uh, that is necessary to de develop herd immunity is actually directly related to how high the transmission rate is. Right now, we've, as you can see, we've controlled it in our population so that at best only 10% of Americans <clears throat> have had COVID-19. <clears throat> if we continue to, to um, have stringent restrictions to control, we would expect that the number needed for herd immunity would be lower, but it would take a lot longer to get to that number. So 30 to 50% maybe would be required with good control, but it might take us two or three years at, or more to get to that 30 to 50%. So you can either get a lot of cases really fast and have devastating effects, or you can uh, control it and have fewer cases over a longer period of time. But the same restraint 
uh, is at play, and that is that the uh, the immunity only lasts six to nine months. So if we stretch it out over two to three years, we're just going to continue to have new patients reinfected over and over, and, and in fact, we'll never get herd immunity. And that's that's actually a really good way to illustrate that whether we uh, entertain a strategy of taking the brakes off or whether we continue a strategy of controlling it to prevent uh, economic health care and, and life lost consequences, herd immunity for COVID-19 is simply not possible. Not through I mean, natural infection at least. Yeah, and I think it's really important to, in response to this person for them to understand that it, if, I feel like it's hard for people to understand the effects of COVID if they are not directly affected, if they're not a healthcare worker, if they're not working longer hours because of it, if they haven't gotten sick or know a family member. And I think it's really important for these people to look to you guys, the healthcare workers that are dealing with this every day and understanding that this is not your normal life. You normally don't work 24 seven on something and not being able to breathe um, and just take a second for yourself. So hopefully the numbers you just illustrated and the effects of just letting it run its course um, sticks in that person's mind. You mentioned herd immunity is not possible for COVID-19. So what exactly can we do to keep this under control and to get over the hump of COVID? Yeah. Well, first of all, just to, to go back to what you just said, um, no one hates COVID more than I do. We, we're tired of it and we recognize that the community at large is tired of it. We're all tired of it. And I also recognize that for, for most people, COVID-19 is not a severe disease. Uh, most people do get over it and most people don't uh, require hospitalization. Uh, fortunately for many of us, we, we don't know anyone who's passed away from COVID-19. And, and fortunately, uh, it's been a blessing in our community that, that the fatality rate has been relatively low. But those numbers um, are very evident when you look at the healthcare systems. And, and where I work every day, right now the hospital is full of COVID patients, which means that we're not able to care for all of the other people in the community who normally fill the hospital. Uh, because the, you know, the, the uh, hospital can only uh, accommodate so many. And so we need to find a sustainable um, community transmission rate that allows us to balance being able to care for all of the other people who, who need care for non-COVID reasons with all of the people who need COVID care. And the better COVID care we give, the less lives are lost. That's the bottom line. I want to talk about the vaccine really quick. Um, so Pfizer came out, or there's some recent reports about Pfizer coming out with the vaccine that is 90% effective, which is a lot higher than the flu's effective rate for a vaccine. Do you have any initial thoughts about that effective rate and what it could potentially mean um, for us in COVID-19? Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because in all of that doom and gloom, there is, there is hope. Um, there's a couple of of reasons to be hopeful. Number one is our community has done a lot in terms of personal sacrifice to keep the numbers under control. And we've, uh, we've demonstrated that we can keep the numbers under control and keep the hospital admissions and the unnecessary deaths at a manageable level. But we're also very hopeful that a vaccine like the Pfizer vaccine and several other products that are, are hot on its heels will not only be effective, but that they will uh, prove to be safe in these phase three clinical trials that are ongoing. And so far, the preliminary results are very promising. And uh, most importantly, we hope that uh, once these vaccines are widely available, that they'll be able to be distributed in a way that will actually allow us to develop herd immunity through a vaccine. And what that means is that um, if the vaccine is widely enough distributed throughout the population, and if the, if the immunity generated by the vaccine is um, long lasting, even, even a year, then we could hope to have herd immunity and control this virus. And, and we're all very hopeful for that. So that was good news yesterday and we look forward to more details from those uh, phase three clinical trials that are crucial for identifying whether it's effective and whether it's safe. 
I want to just ask you one more quick question. Someone asked us how long we can expect to live like this, where we're doing things a little bit different. We're wearing masks. We're not hanging out with people as often. And I know you don't have a magic eight ball and can't give us an exact number, but with good news about the vaccine and uh, the immunity, the three to nine months that you're starting to see, do you have any idea on how long you think um, we'll be living in more of this pandemic type world? Yeah, like you said, it's hard um, to look in the crystal ball. Right now we're looking at getting through the winter um, without, um, without getting into a crisis situation. And we recognize that to do that, we are requiring um, more personal sacrifice from people. And that, that really is uh, because the winter time we know um, is a, a period of time where we just always have higher rates of these respiratory viruses and, and COVID-19 is proving to, to behave exactly the same way. So um, we're, we're anxious to pull together and get through the winter. We're anxious to have the first, um, the first distributions of these vaccines, hopefully uh, sometime towards the end of this year distributed to high risk healthcare workers and other high risk individuals in the population. And then uh, to see that more widely distributed um, through the first half of 2021, hopefully to see more and more of the population um, uh, having access to a safe and effective vaccine. And, and as that happens, and as we continue to find sustainable ways to keep our hospital admissions, our ICU admissions, and our unnecessary deaths low, I think that we'll, um, we'll need to come together with public health officials and the community to find a sustainable balance through um, spring and summer of 2021, at least. And I want to remind people too, this is, it, it feels like it's been happening for 10 years, but it hasn't even been a year. So like you said, we got to get through the winter first and and see how we do with that and then kind of reevaluate. So Dr. Webb, is there anything else that you'd like to mention to us today? Any last messages you have for our viewers? Just big thanks to everyone who is taking this seriously, even though for, for you at home watching, it, this may not uh, cause severe disease, but it might for someone you know, and it certainly does for a lot of people that I see every day. Uh, and so I just, I just wanted to tell everyone who's, who might be watching, we, we really appreciate your efforts. Um, we recognize that it's hard to live this new normal. Um, but from my perspective, it's terribly important and we really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Dr. Webb. I appreciate the time you took to talk to us today. And if anyone has any questions around COVID-19 and seeing if they qualify for a test, you can go to intermountain.com slash COVID testing. It'll walk you through some questions related to symptoms and exposure. And if you do qualify for a test, you'll be given the chance to select an appointment arrival time. We now have scheduled appointments throughout the system for curbside testing. We also still have our emotional health relief hotline available seven days a week from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. It's a free support service line. And that phone number is 833-442. 2211. Dr. Webb, again, thank you so much, and we'll talk to you next time.